system. And you will also see that there are several alterations in, the, in this disease. And many of these alterations are also visible in other diseases, in other chronic inflammatory diseases with a chronic inflammation in the tissue. Um, I will talk about why nerves are important in arthritis. We talk about the loss of sympathetic nerve fibers. I mentioned this already a little, make a, uh, this a little bit more concrete. Then that the role of the sympathetic nervous system in an inflammatory disease, the role of sympathetic cells. This is uh, cooperation with the Varese group of uh, Marco and Franca. The, the so we, we call them sympathetic cells, but these are cells that produce catecholamines. And then we, in, uh, at the end, I talk about how sympathetic nerve fibers are linked to fat tissue. Fat tissue becomes more and more important in, the, in recent years. Um, we recognize that the fat tissue is not simply a store of uh, energy-rich fuels, but also a, a, a source of many cytokines and so-called adipokines. And we just recently linked the fat tissue to the sympathetic nerve fibers in arthritis in the synovial tissue of patients. Okay, so we start. This is, I show you now some examples uh, which so nicely demonstrate that uh, the nervous system has something to do with the arthritis. In literature, we have approximately 33 case reports where people have demonstrated that the patient with a hemiparetic site is prevented from becoming rheumatoid arthritic. You see, on the non-paretic side, he has these typical changes of rheumatoid arthritis. The first change is that these, uh, these, the fingers are turned to the ulna, to the ulna, the ulna side. It's called ulna deviation. The patient starts to make something like this. And then they have little erosions. And so you see this, or, or changes of the bone here. You see the, how the bone gets more or less dense. And you see little changes here. The, and here you even have these erosions, and you see the same here. And you see that the, st the styloid is not, not uh, so dense anymore. But on the hemiparetic side, on the other side, you don't see these signs. So when you see that a patient has a paresis, a plagia on one side, and, and it doesn't get rheumatoid arthritis on this side, this is highly interesting. And in the not paresis side, the normal side, he gets the disease. And on the non paretic side, he has a higher level of temperature, which is a classical sign for inflammation. And on the left side, as you can see here, his, the temperature is lower, showing less inflammation. One example. This is another example. This is a disease called scleroderma, where the patient starts to get a very thick and fibrotic skin and he starts to get this fibrotic skin in the fingertips. And it has to do with ischemia in the, in the fingertips. Um, the vessels, the vessel walls are very thick. They have a fibrotic thickening. And this makes ischemia. And the ischemia leads to ultra, as you can see here, these ulcers. And this changes, of course, uh, the, the skin. And interestingly, this only happens on the non paretic side. This was a known patient in our, in our uh, outpatient clinic, but it doesn't happen on the paretic side. So the paretic side was completely clean, no ulcera. Another example. This is a polymyalgia rheumatica patient. This is a completely different disease. In this disease, elderly patients uh, above the age of 60 start to get inflammation, which is strong inflammation with a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And what they all also get is uh, arthritic in joints, for example, here in the shoulder, shoulder joints. And you see that on this side, this patient had a, a plexus palsy, meaning he had an accident. And with the accident, there was a cut of the, of the, um, of the nerves that can't get out of the, of the spine, a cut. And in this area where he had this palsy, the inflammation was ver very much lower as compared to the intact side. So you see, you need an intact nervous system to make inflammation. 
We don't know exactly at the moment which type of nerve fibers are relevant here. But most probably, the sensory nerve, ty nerve fibers are relevant. If you lose the sensory innervation, then you lose also the substance P release into the local area. And as I mentioned before, substance P as a pro-inflammatory factor. Um, it would be lost in those areas, and this would lead to less inflammatory stimulus locally. So one can hypothesize um, that uh, particularly the sensory nerve fibers must be affected by this hemiparesis, plexus palsy, et cetera, et cetera. It's not exactly known because we cannot, you cannot uh, go into the, into, into the patient in this case, for example, and really check the nerve fiber types, et cetera, et cetera, has never been done in a systematic way, not in a systematic way. So you clearly see that these nerve fibers are relevant in diseases. I already mentioned this slide, um, the substance P as the pro-inflammatory slide uh, site should be blocked in a way, and if it's blocked, then you have a preponderance of the sympathetic site in the tissue in the fingertips or in the shoulder joints or, or in the, the hand joints, and that would lead to a more anti-inflammatory situation. So we talk about loss of sympathetic nerve fibers. Um, I have shown this slide already. I repeat it, but rep repetition is always good, particularly when you're not so uh, so familiar with the subjects. Again, in rheumatoid arthritis patients, the anti-inflammatory sympathetic nerve fibers have a much lower density in the synovial tissue. So this is in the joint tissue um, compared to the arthrosis patients and the controls, and it is opposite for sensory nerve fibers with substance P. And this is a clear shift into the direction of uh, inflammation. We once asked what could be a reason for such a differential density in the tissue. Um, wait a moment. Uh, before I show it in a rat model, um, and a rat model in a rat model, it's very similar. These rats are immunized with an antigen that induces arthritis in the rat. You take collagen type 2. Collagen type 2 is the major collagen that is in the joint. So if you inject the collagen type 2 together with a strong stimulatory factor like Freund adjuvant, you make an autoimmune disease against the collagen type 2. So this is done in the rats. And when you go into the, look into the, um, into the joints of these rats over time, so the control, day 14, day 28, day 41, day 55, the disease starts at around day 15 to 20 or somewhere here in between. Then you see from the control level that rapidly, very rapidly until day 28 and day 41, day 65, so no, no big difference here anymore. But in comparison to the control, a big jump in the density of sympathetic nerve fibers. So it's not only in the human joint, it's in the red joint, it's in the red intestinal tract, it's in, the, it's in endometriosis, for example, in the, in the woman, it's in an uh, in in, in inflammatory foot disease called Charcot disease. So we looked at several things, it's always the same. It's always a loss of sympathetic nerve fibers. So when we have a loss of sympathetic nerve fibers and a sprouting of sensory nerve fibers, as you can see here, loss means the nerve fibers are not in the tissue anymore, but they, they are somewhere. They are not lost. They are not killed. They should be somewhere, but we don't see it in the tissue. So we expect that the nerve fibers are somewhere out of the tissue and that there could be a kind of demarcation line, una linea demarcazione, huh? Uh, which separates the in highly inflamed uh, tissue from the normal tissue. And in the tissue, you can, now you can think, how can a nerve fiber be there or not there? And you can say, are the nerve growth factors there, for example? Growth factors are important for nerve fibers, clear. And you think of the nerve growth factor of uh, Rita Levi-Montalcini, and you recognize that 
nerve growth factors and other growth factors are very well there. They are highly upregulated. So, it's not the growth factor that makes the difference. The difference is made by so-called nerve repellent factors. There's another group, those that help growing the nerves and those that repel the nerves. Repulsion factors, repulsione, are extremely important to guide the nerve fibers during the embryological development because the sensory nerve fibers are in completely different areas as compared to the, to the sympathetic nerve fibers. So the repellent factors are dictating the guidance, not the growth factors. The growth factors are there, but the repellent factors are not there. This is an example of a repellent factor, a repellent factor of semaphorin 3C, semaphorin 3C. Um, and we found, for example, that this positive cells for semaphorin 3C are higher, are clearly higher in rheumatoid arthritis patients as compared to osteoarthritic and control patients. So they have higher levels or higher numbers of these positive nerve fibers. We also look for other repellent factors, semaphorin 3F is another one, and is also much higher in the tissue. But the repellent factors for the sensory nerve fibers, these, they are called also semaphorins, and the name is semaphorin 3A. A is for the sensory, F and C is for the sympathetic. The A, the A numbers, the, or, or, or the other way around, we don't find semaphorin 3A in the inflamed tissue. Not at all. There's no semaphorin 3A. So the sensory nerve fibers get not repelled, but the, um, the uh, sympathetic nerve fibers get specifically repelled. We, tested now, we test things like this now in nerve outgrowth assays. We take the ganglion, the ganglion, sympathetic chain ganglion, put it into a culture slide, give semaphorin 3F, and 3C on the culture slide, observe how the axons uh, rapidly go back. It looks like, <laughs> and it's very fast, within five hours, the axons make <laughs> and go back. And the rest of the axon remains in, the, in thick branches, thick axon branches. So the, the cytoplasm of the axon is not lost, but uh, when you imagine, that there's repulsion, it makes like this, then the rest of the axon becomes much thicker and it remains in near the ganglion and it's beautiful, it's very beautiful. I, I don't have a movie with me today. Another thing is the sensory hyperinnervation. This, this can be specifically tested, it's not so easy to demonstrate it in a very nice way, sensory hyperinnervation. What we did, we took synovial tissue, this is the synovial tissue, from patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And this was taken during a first knee operation with arthroscopy. You go into the joint, make arthroscopy, and you put away a piece of the synovial tissue, first operation. And then you look into density of substance P positive nerve fibers. And you see here during the first operation, these are the, every symbol represents one patient. So we have patients with a lot of nerve fibers, but also with a little nerve fibers, something in between. What did you see here, the numbers. When we did a second operation of the same area, exactly of the same area, the first part of the tissue was already removed, and we now look on the second part of the tissue. And the classical sign of sensory hyperinnervation is that you have higher numbers of these sprouting. This is called sprouting. Sprouting means first one, two, three, four, Five, that's sprouting, and that happens very, very near to the end of the terminals. And if you remove the second part of the tissue, you would expect that the numbers are lower. And indeed, you see with each patient, this is a patient, and this is the same patient, this is a patient, this is a patient, this is a patient, you lose the sensory nerve fiber. So there's clear, clear indication that in the outer area of the synovial tissue, there was hyperinnervation. And hyperinnervation is not good. Because hyperinnervation means you have substance P in high amounts, and substance P is a pro-inflammatory factor, and you induce substance P release by local cytokines, and you don't want that. But this has been positively selected for acute wound phenomena and not for the chronic inflammatory disease. We talk about the dual role of sympathetic nerve fibers, or the sympathetic nervous system. What does it mean? One can block the sympathetic nerve system 
by using specific factors. You can do this, for example, by using an antibody against dopamine beta hydroxylase, which is coupled to saporin. Now I explain this. You have the nerve ending, the nerve ending like this. The nerve ending opens a vesicle like this, and dopamine beta hydroxylase is in the inner membrane of the vesicle. And the antibody binds to this uh, dopamine beta hydroxylase and gets internalized, internalizatio. And, and sensazione, okay. Ah, uh, yeah, right. But you know what I mean? Internal, internalized and has a saporin on the other side. And the saporin is toxic for the cell. So the entire antibody is taken up, taken up into the soma of the nerve fiber and destroys the nerve fiber within two to three days. So you can kill the sympathetic nerve system. And we did this at different time points. When you do it on day minus seven, even before you immunize the animals with collagen type two in the green cu curve, you see that if you take away the sympathetic nerve fibers, you have a much lower expression of the disease as compared to the control group. This is the control group within intact sympathetic nerve fibers, but without the sympathetic nerve fibers, here at the beginning, before the disease starts, you have a much lower expression. You have to know that the sympathetic nerve fibers, when they have been destroyed, they come back. So we expect that the increase here by the, of the disease expression is simply because the sympathetic nerve fibers come back. And when you do that at day 18, in the middle of the immunization process, somewhere here, then you see the, this is not the similar strong as with the green line. And when you do it on day 30 here, is, is no effect at all. So you see the influence of the sympathetic nerve fibers change. At the beginning, in the very early phase, it is clearly pro-inflammatory. It supports the disease, because if you take away, the, the expression of the disease is much lower. Okay? Now, when you make the sympathectomy in the late phase, in the late phase of the disease, here is the control group, this is the control group, and when you do the sympathectomy in the late chronic phase, it's opposite, it's completely opposite. Now, okay, I go up. Here you have a lower, exp a lower expression of the disease, amelioration, and, oh, and here you have an increase of the disease. It's a big, 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 big difference. Something is changing with the sympathetic nervous system. And this is the dual role of the sympathetic nervous system. And we are still looking for the factors that might be responsible. This is a suggestion. Um, in, the f in an early phase, let's say you immunize an animal. Here's the time. Yeah, first of all, here's the time. And here's the disease activity on the y-axis, disease activity time. If you immunize an animal here at the beginning, here at the beginning. Then you induce the disease, but the disease is under a s symptom threshold. You don't see symptoms in the animals. The animals start to get the disease on day 25, 28, but you immunize already on day zero. So there's a sub-threshold situation. And during the first phase, the, during the immunization phase, these cells play the um, important role. The dendritic cells, they present the antigen to T cells and B cells. And there's also redistribution and migration of the cells. So at the beginning, um, mainly these cells in lymphoid organs, in the spleen and in the lymph nodes play the major role. And they are influenced in a different way by the sympathetic nervous system as compared to this situation in a later phase. Because in the later phase, when the disease breaks up, out, disease breaks out, you have uh, also other cells that get involved, like the neutrophil, like the fibroblast in the tissue, like the mast cell in the tissue, the NK cell, and there are other cells. And, and here, the influence of the sympathetic nerve fibers is probably completely opposite compared to this side. This is a suggestion. This is a hypothesis. And it needs to be studied, and we are still studying it. But there was something very special with, with these um, things. We found in the tissue sympathetic cells, uh, it, as I mentioned already before, we think that we lose the sympathetic nerve fibers behind the demarcation line, and we have the si sensory hyperinnervation. When you take this tissue and 
you test the tissue or the supernatants of the tissue uh, for the catecholamine content in the supernatant, you would expect that a patient with rheumatoid arthritis has, has much less norepinephrine, nor adrenaline in the supernatant compared to a patient with osteoarthritis because he has less nerve fibers. So he should, certainly has uh, less noradrenaline in the supernatant. And we did this. We have little micro superfusion chambers, little small cameras yeah, with, uh, where we can superfuse the tissue. And um, the, the medium is coming from here, goes into the chamber. Here, by the way, these are platin electrodes. Um, which are used for electrical stimulation, but this is not the, uh, the question here. It's just simply superfusion of the culture medium, and you collect here uh, on these tips, you collect uh, the superfusate. And when you look on the uh, noradrenaline no concentration in the superfusate, interestingly, the rheumatoid arthritis patient and the osteoarthritic patient were the same. And you would not have expected it because of the density of the sympathetic nerve fibers. Then we went back into the tissue and said something is wrong, and we thought that because we knew Mar uh, Marco's work uh, that uh, cells can produce catecholamines, we got back into the tissue and we found that the cells in the synovial tissue are positive for tyrosine hydroxylase, as you can see here, the positive stain, or tyrosine, tyrosinase. This is all the, the, the red staining here in the middle, here, little, here, little, here, little, here, little. Here a little, here a little. And when you look on all the different catecholaminergic um, enzymes like dopa decarboxylase and dopamine beta hydroxylase, you see that the rheumatoid arthritis patients have a higher density of positive cells as compared to osteoarthritic patients. And it was relatively clear. So in the tissue, we start to have cells. We have cells that are sympathetic, that produce catecholamines. So... The cell types are very ubiquitous. Macrophages produces, fibroblasts produces, B cells and mast cells and neutrophils, but not T cells. This is different from your work. In your, your work, you always show in the peripheral blood, in the peripheral blood, that the T cells have uh, the synthesis machinery. But in the rheumatoid arthritis patient, we only see uh, these cells and not the T cells. This is a little strange for us, but Marco. Marco uh, might have a better, a good idea on it, and we we'll, can can comment on it a little later. So, um, this is you, you can say take another marker of sympathetic cells, and another marker would be um, the transporter for um, catecholamines, which is the vesicular monamine transporter (VMAT type 2) transports from the outside to the inside. Um, the uh, catecholamines. And you see also using this marker here, the red cells, you see this, and the staining, but we have higher levels of these cells compared to osteoarthritis. It's not only the synthesis machinery, but also the uptake machinery. And when you look into a disease like collagen type 2 arthritis in, in animals over time, so we again immunize the animals on day zero, and look for these VMAT2 positive cells, then you see that in the arthritic animals, in the bone marrow, for example, the cells start to become more and more and more and more and more and more. So we have more sympathetic cells with the time, which goes on and on. And it's the same in the lymph node, it's the same in the spleen, and it's the same in the bone marrow, and it's the same in the joint. They appear all of, all of a sudden, these cells start to appear. Now, when you try to ma manipulate um, the, the catecholamine, catecholamine production, you try to manipulate it by changing, uh, for example, the, 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 the transport of noradrenaline into the vesic vesicles or by blocking the degradation of noradrenaline. You can do this by uh, drugs. And this was collaboration with, um, with <coughs> Marco. Um, and this can be done, for example, with resapine. Resapine blocks this channel, so you have more norepinephrine uh, outside, and you can block it with a, a COMT blocker, and you have more norepinephrine in the cytoplasma. And when we do that, 
then we clearly see that these sympathetic cells have an, are anti-inflammatory when the catecholamine concentrations are increased with a clear inhibition of TNF. I summarized this only. I, I don't sh show much of the data. The data are, are published in this uh, paper in the Annals of Rheumatic Diseases. So the cells, the sympathetic cells, are anti-inflammatory. They stop the production of cytokines. And when we use our, for example, our uh, sympathectomy technique, 6 hydroxydopamine or the antibody technique, doesn't matter. When we use the technique, you see that we can completely wipe out uh, these 6 hydroxydopamine positive sym sympathetic cells. They are completely gone. Uh, and you see here the thiocyanin hydroxylase, but here is only very little and, and nearly they are all gone. Um, so we kill with our sympathectomy technique, we kill the sympathetic cells in addition. So when we kill sympathetic cells that are anti-inflammatory, we think that this sympathectomy um, effect in the late phase where the cells come up and are already there in la to a large extent, that this uh, pro-inflammatory response does, has nothing to do with the sympathetic nerve fiber, but has something to do with the sympathetic cells because the sympathetic cells become anti-inflammatory and you kill them, then you have uh, a higher expression of the disease. It, we, still we still do not have the absolute proof, but we are shortly before to have the absolute proof by using the cells, the tyrosine hydroxylase positive cells, and giving those cells to uh, to animals with active arthritis. And if those animals who receive the tyrosine hydroxylase positive cells have a lower expression of the arth arthritis, we clearly know that these cells are anti-inflammatory, and this we are shortly before to show this. Not so easy. Okay, we come to the last part of the talk, and we talk about the fat tissue now. What is the sympathetic nerve fibers doing in the fat tissue? Does somebody know? Why are the beta 2 receptor? You know it. Loud. Lipolysis, exactly. Lipolysis, meaning breakdown of fat to free fatty acids. Degradation of the triglycerides. The triglycerides are break broken down to free fatty acids. Okay, and glycerol, by the way. So, it, what we always saw in our patients when we got the material, it looks like this, a little, little dirty as usual. Um, we have the synovial tissue. This is the white part here, the white part. You see a little white here, here, here. And, but in between the white part and behind the synovial tissue, we have a lot of fat tissue. And this is unusual because normally when you open your, your, your joint, you, have, you don't have much synovial fat tissue. The synovial fat tissue starts to, to come to the place during the disease process. And a similar increase of fat tissue happens in Crohn's disease. It's called the creeping fat. It's a fat, it's a type of fat that is on the, on the intestinal tract, on the, on the intestine, on the outside. It starts to, to get involved by fat tissue. And the, the, um, and the other diseases, the Graves disease, the Basedov disease, where you have the increase of fat tissue, for example, in, in an inflammatory area. And um, most lymph nodes are com embedded in fat tissue. There is no lymph node without fat tissue around. You always have fat tissue around the lymph node. This is work from Caroline Pond from the United Kingdom. She showed, she very nicely showed that most of the lymph nodes are embedded in fat tissue. Okay, well, why, do, why does the tissue, why does an inflamed tissue or a lymph node or an activated lymph node or whatever need the fat tissue around? You can think of the atypokines, of the cytokines that are coming out of the fat tissue. But you also can think about the free fatty acids. The free fatty acids are energy-rich fuels. They support the immune system. So what we also saw, that in lymphoid organs, like in the synovial tissue, at the same time when the sympathetic nerve fibers get lost in uh, in the synovial tissue, they also get lost in the lymphoid organs. So it's the same. 
removing sympathetic nerve fiber is a pro-inflammatory factor, but removing it from the lymph node has a similar pro-inflammatory influence. You lose it also in the lymph nodes, and you lose it in the spleen. You see how fast it is? It's a collagen type 2 arthritis model. In the healthy animals, you have a relatively high number in the lymph organs. But then, with the expression of the disease, the disease starts here at around day 20 to 25. You lose the sympathetic nerve fibers. But interestingly, around the lymph nodes, in the fat tissue, there's an increase of the sympathetic nerve fibers. Now recall this effect of the repulsion, like this. If the if the lymph node produces the repellent factors and repel the, lymph, the sympathetic nerve fibers in the lymph node, then you get mo uh, probably more sympathetic nerve fibers in the surrounding fat tissue. And when you cut the fat tissue, you more often see nerve fibers because they are thicker. They are like this, and then you cut more often. And this is most probably the reason why we see a higher number of sympathetic nerve fiber density in the fat tissue around the lymph nodes. And we also, and this is a big difference, you see the arthritic animals have approximately eight nerve fibers per square millimeter as a median, and the healthy animals have a, 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 a median of zero. It's not zero, okay, but uh, good. Again, and in the rheumatoid arthritis patients, I mentioned that in the synovial tissue, the nerve fibers are low. This is a repetition, again, a repetition. But in, the, in this surrounding fat tissue, the sympathetic nerve fiber density is higher in the rheumatoid arthritis as compared to osteoarthritis patients. Here, not only in the animal, but also in the human uh, disease, you have higher numbers of the sympathetic nerve fibers. So interestingly now, and this is the most important aspect, in these animals with arthritis, the fat tissue is activated. And activation here means that um, the, the, the vacuoles get much smaller. You see, this is the arthritic uh, type. This is the control. In the control, one fat cell has one big vacuole. And in the arthritis side, one fat cell has many, many little vacuoles, as you can see here. And you see how this is related to the lymph node. This is the lymph node. Here is the, the big vacuoles, and here the lots of small vacuoles around, around the lymph node. And when you count, carefully count the percentage of fat cells with small vacuoles, then they, they are higher in arthritis uh, as compared to controls. And when you count the number of fat vacuoles per small vacuoled adipocytes, so you use only the small vacuoled adipocytes, so there are more small vacuoles in the arthritic animals compared to the control animals. And this is a clear sign for activation. And this activation is made possible by the sympathetic nerve fibers via the beta adrenergic receptors. You don't need to prove this, because this has been shown many, many times. So the repulsion, the repulsion of sympathetic nerve fibers is a starting point for a better activation of the fat tissue, so that the fat tissue releases more free fatty acids that nourish, that support the inflammatory process. So this is our model for the sympathetic nerve fibers, uh, for the sympathetic nerve fibers in arthritis. Arthritis starts somewhere as an autoimmune process. With the autoimmune process, there is invasion of inflammatory cells into the tissue. With the invasion of these cells, here lymph lymphocytes, here monocytes, and macro become macrophages, here neutrophils, here dendritic cells, who remain in the tissue. So with the invasion of these cells, the cells start to produce repellent factors. The repellent factors are here painted in the, in the green dots here, and they start to produce the repellent factors, and the repellent factors throw out the sympathetic nerve fibers. They throw it out behind a demarcation line. And the demarcation line, interestingly, in the synovial tissue, ends in the fat tissue. And in the fat tissue, via beta adrenergic effects, the sympathetic nerve fibers start to release free fatty acids that nourish the local inflammatory process. That is the, uh, the concept that we have at the moment for our research in the sympathetic nerve fibers. I summarize. Hemiparesis is linked to disease manifestation, and the pro-inflammatory sensory nerve fibers are most probably lost. It's not investigated in, in absolute detail, but this is the hypothesis. There's loss of sympathetic and sprouting of sensory nerve fibers in arthritis, with the loss of the inflammatory beta-adrenergic effects. This is not only in the joint, but in the lymphoid organ. 
The sympathetic nerve fiber is pro-inflammatory in early arthritis, but anti-inflammatory in late. That was our initial concept. But we think that in the late phase, there exist sympathetic anti-inflammatory cells, and when we kill it with the same techniques that are used here at the beginning of the disease, then we kill these anti-inflammatory cells and we have a higher expression of the disease. And sympathetic nerve fibers in fat tissue most probably support lipolysis, breaking down fat tissue and support the local inflammatory process in the joint, but also around the lymph nodes. That's it with respect to sympathetic nerve fibers. Any questions?